Welcome to the Sunday service from the Church of Ireland, St Nicholas in Adair, County Limerick, with the churches of Croom, Kilpeacon and Kilmallock. At the beginning of November, there coincide two commemorations, two church holy days that form in the run-up to Advent, part of what has come to be named the Season of Remembering, All Hallows. One of the commemorations, All Saints, features quite comfortably in the Anglican and Protestant calendars. The other, All Souls, is sometimes viewed with suspicion, but there is really no need. We just have to move past the over-sensitivities of the past. This combined season of All Hallows, this time of remembering, reminds us not only of those who have gone before us in all their infinite variety, the famous and the obscure, the virtuous and the sinful, but that we are also in the business of building souls, our own. And so we start our service in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God is love, and those who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. You are the never-ceasing open gift of love. We turn in upon ourselves. Lord, have mercy. You live beyond all centres of power. We seek to enclose your grace. Christ, have mercy. You rejoice in a multitude of names. We try to pin you down. Lord, have mercy. May the power of heaven protect us this day and circle us with a blessing of peace. May Christ, our Lord and loving friend, protect us this day and circle us with affection and love. May the Spirit of Truth who dwells in our hearts protect us this day and circle and fill us with joy. Amen. And so we pray. God of holiness, your glory is proclaimed in every age. As we rejoice in the faith of your saints, inspire us to follow their example with boldness and joy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now hear the Gospel of Jesus according to John. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench, because he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Here ends the reading. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
At the beginning of November, there coincide two commemorations, two church holy days that form, in the run-up to Advent, part of what has come to be named the Season of Remembering, traditionally All Hallows. One of the commemorations, All Saints, features quite comfortably in the Anglican and Protestant calendars. The other, All Souls, is sometimes viewed with suspicion, but there is really no need. We just have to move past the oversensitivities of the past. Let us take All Saints first. The saints are not perfect. In fact, they don't have to be particularly nice or friendly or be bathed in light or all the other things that conventional stereotypes might suppose to be saintly. They may or may not wear loose-fitting robes with hoods. Sandals are also optional, especially in cold climates. Neither are they particularly good-looking or attractive. In fact, many of them would have been rather grumpy, sometimes a bit smelly, especially by modern standards. They may not have been especially civil or overtly caring and considerate. They might have been selfish, like us, sinful and imperfect, like us, all too human, like us. They were people who laughed and cried, loved and lost, people who had families and friends and sometimes enemies. They may well have been obstinate and rather one-track, single-minded almost to the point of obsessive, Indeed, that may almost be an essential qualification. Some of them may have had mental health issues, led lives that at times were selfish, in some cases even debauched and wild. But there came a point when all that faded into the background and what came into sharp relief clear to us later, if not immediately to people of their own time, was a certain holiness, a divine spark, a connection with the eternal, which went beyond the everyday, far beyond the ordinary, and marked them out, set them apart. A saint. But how might we define a saint? A glimpse of something holy, perhaps, something that lies beyond the here and now, the limitations of our human nature, and gives us some intimation of eternity, some tiny glimpse behind the curtain. A signpost, a hand pointing onward, a dim light that shines in the direction of Christ towards the nature of God, and particularly God evidenced in all, or even just part of, a human life. Just a spark, rather than the fire, a chink of light rather than the glare of the sun, or drop or two of water compared to the ocean of eternity, but something unique, profoundly personal, very much of that person, but all, also hinting at something that lies beyond, something that completes and fulfills what we can scarcely recognise in this life. How do you qualify for the job? Now, we can all compile a list of the saints who most appeal to us, and I suspect that the list would reveal quite a lot about us, as well it might. For surely the saints are examples, examples that we should hope to follow in some small way in our own lives. They shine a light onto the Christian faith and into our hearts. It occurs to me that the Beatitudes in Matthew's Gospel match pretty well against any list of saints, probably with most lists of saints, that you might come up with, as long as we rightly interpret what the Beatitudes mean. Blessed are the poor in spirit. 
In other words, those who acknowledge their need, who admit their woundedness and their failings, those who are bravely prepared to change and grow. Blessed are those who mourn, because they have loved, they have committed to something, someone outside themselves. They have, at some time, in some way, loved their God and their neighbour. Blessed are the meek, meaning those who have such humility that they acknowledge that they do not always come first. Those who have honoured the great commandments to love God and neighbour as well as, sometimes even before, oneself. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. What courage it takes to sometimes suffer and shoulder injustice, unfairness, unwarranted cruelty in order to serve the higher purpose, to rise above. Then we have all Souls Day, which was originally based on the doctrine of purgatory and the assumption that even the faithful were deemed to have sins still clinging to their souls after death, preventing them from entering heaven directly. Instead, they would have to undergo a period, short for some, very long for others, of purgation in which sins were atoned for and due punishment received. And so people would pray for them, especially for those they had loved and lost, souls for whom they had an intimate and personal concern, for ancestors, relatives and those of their own community. And it was the notion that the church could somehow intervene, offer preferential mitigating terms, a commuting of sentence here, a shortening of time served there, in exchange for profiting the church in some way. It was such abuse that, in part, led to the Reformation. Today, however, our prayers are not concerned with sparing our loved ones' punishment. Thank goodness we are putting aside notions of a God of vengeance and retribution, but they have much more to do with the idea of continuing a loving conversation, of keeping people's memories alive and honouring their continuing reality in our hearts and lives. For at All Souls we remember people who are not particularly famous, nor were they necessarily examples to many, but we remember those who are so inextricably linked with us that they may well have been among the most important influences in our lives. At All Souls, the memories are profoundly personal and intimate, many of them joyful, some tinged with regret, and often overlaid with the pain of loss, a burden of grief that, over the years, we may get used to carrying. But even if its raw power may have lessened, nevertheless, a part of them will always be in us and us in them. Few of us have ever been spared the pain of loss, sometimes repeatedly. And at all souls we can especially remember that this is a burden of human mortality that each one of us carries, one that we should not and need not carry alone. This combined season of All Hallows, this time of remembering, reminds us not only of those 
who have gone before us in all their infinite variety, the famous and the obscure, the virtuous and the sinful, but that we are also in the business of building souls, our own, that at the end of our lives we take nothing with us save what we have stored inside. That true happiness, true mental and spiritual health lies in moving beyond our simple existence, aspiring beyond ourselves, conquering the fears, the pain, the longings and even the hopes and dreams that sometimes only serve to limit and hold us down. For they are all finite, transient, ephemeral, shaped by the influence of others, only serving the desire to please or impress others. Whereas the character of self-transcendence is based in humility and reverence for the mystery of life that we did not create, but of which we are a part vanishingly small, but also infinitely unique, standing in the vast river of time that flows through the saints, through those we have loved and lost, and into the future, in which even now we have our eternal place. So let us always remember and pray for all the saints, for all the loved and remembered souls who have gone before us and commit to crafting our own souls with care and devotion as we prepare ourselves one day to join them. Amen. We are pilgrims along the way of life, Therefore, let us remind ourselves of the path of faith that has brought us to this time and place. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God, the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us now pray for our church, for ourselves and neighbours, and for the needs of the whole world. God of the past. On this feast of all saints, we remember before you, with thanks, the lives of those Christians who have gone before us, all who have been loyal and true, all who have served and witnessed, all who have been holy and example to us, those whose goodness transformed all they did. Give us grace to follow their example and continue their work. Christ be with us, around and beside us. God of the present, on this feast of all saints with all souls, we remember before you those who have had more recently died, including those we have loved and lost, giving thanks for their lives and example and for all that they have meant to us. Though they may not have been famous or celebrated, they left indelible marks of love on our hearts and our lives. We pray for those who grieve and for all who suffer throughout the world, for the hungry, the sick, the victims of violence and persecution. Christ be with us, around and beside us. God of the future, on this feast of all saints, we remember before you the newest generation of your saints, 
for those being persecuted and suffering for their faith and principles, for those facing oppression and injustice. We pray for the future of the church and for all who nurture and encourage faith in humility and generosity. As we celebrate the courage and sacrifice of the past, may we in turn be similarly dedicated in our own time to the causes of justice, mercy and peace for all. Christ be with us, around and beside us. God of all, we give you thanks for the whole company of your saints, with whom in fellowship we join our prayers and praises in the name of Jesus Christ. Christ be with us, around and beside us. We remember war-torn cities, towns and villages in Ukraine and Gaza, the victims of the 7th of October attack in Israel, Russia and the peoples of all nations engaged in conflict. In a moment of silence, we pray for an end to violence and hatred. Christ be with us, around and beside us. And now a few moments for our own concerns and prayers for those on our hearts. Together we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May God give to you and all those whom you love 
his comfort and his peace, his light and his joy in this world and the next. And may the hope of the sacred three surround and encourage and bless us now and for ever. Amen. Let us go in the peace of Christ. Thanks be to God.